Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. The United States has the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world. Healthcare for people in jails and prisons is rarely part of mainstream healthcare and health policy conversations. But people who are incarcerated have significant health needs and a legal right to medical treatment. In addition, with 10 million people released from jail every year, needs that aren't met while people are incarcerated reemerge in the community. Now, while the number of people incarcerated in the United States has started to decline, the share of the incarcerated population that's older has grown, placing additional strain on health systems that are already under a great deal of pressure. The health needs of older people in jail is the topic of this episode of A Health Policy. I'm here today with Rachel Bedard, Research Fellow at the Institute to End Mass Incarceration at Harvard Law School. Dr. Bedard and co-authors published a paper in the May 2022 issue of Health Affairs, assessing the health and health needs of incarcerated older adults in New York City. They found that incarcerated older adults had greater health vulnerabilities than their younger counterparts. For example, they're more likely to be homeless and they used more healthcare services while incarcerated. They're also more likely to suffer from serious mental and physical illnesses. We'll discuss these findings and more in today's episode. Dr. Bedard, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, Your paper covers uh, ground that there's not a lot of information published about, and so I'm really eager to get uh, deeper into what you found. Let's start with the focus of your study. You looked at people age 55 or older in jail Uh, Tell us a little more about this population, uh, what profile they have within the broader population in jail, and for those who maybe haven't even been introduced to the subject, uh, a little bit about the unique circumstances of people who are in jail. Sure. So I wrote this paper, I started this research when I was um, the director of geriatrics and complex care for the New York City jail system. And in that capacity, I ran a t- an interdisciplinary team of people who provided care, court advocacy services, and reentry planning services to the 200 oldest and sickest detainees in the New York City jail system, the majority of whom were being held on Rikers Island. Just as very sort of basic background for the listeners, jails and prisons are distinct. Prisons are where people um, go after they have been sentenced, they've been convicted of a crime, and they go to serve a sentence for a felony. Jails are places where people are are mostly being held in pretrial detention. The majority of the folks in the New York City jail system are people who are still very much in the innocent until proven guilty phase. They have been charged but not convicted, and they are being held while their case moves forward through the court system. What is very notable about this paper and this study is that it contributes to a literature that's Um, not yet really discussed the role of an aging jail system to the extent that an aging justice system has been covered at all in the medical literature. It has focused predominantly on people who are aging in place in prison systems, people who were arrested perhaps when they were much younger and received long sentences and have been aging in place while incarcerated. Our study focuses on people who were incarcerated in the jail system and therefore, by definition, they were predominantly people who had recently been arrested for new charges. It is just not part of the way that we popularly imagine who's getting arrested to think about there being a substantial population of older folks who are being arrested with all sorts of charges. Um, And so describing that population was sort of what we were trying to do here. You uh, mentioned the contrast between jails and prisons, and you mentioned this notion of aging in place. So as if you have an older population in a prison, presumably they've been there for a while, you have a sense of their needs, there's hopefully some stability in the treatment plans and the context for meeting their needs. I gather that's quite different in a jail where someone has just been arrested, they've been brought in, and you probably don't know a whole lot about them. So talk to me a little bit about sort of what it 
what someone confronts as they come in the front door of the jail, particularly if they are part of this older population. Right. So your question is exactly, gets to exactly the right point, which is that jails are places that are defined by the churn. Their population are folks who are coming in and are expected to stay for a short period of time, sometimes just days, sometimes hours, often weeks, um, before they leave again. They get bailed out or their cases drop or whatever happens and they return to the community. They are not supposed to be places where people are aging in place. You are not supposed to be in jail for months and years. However, I will say that in New York City, where there is a persistent backup in sort of moving people's cases through the court system, we actually do have very, very long average lengths of stay for our folks, and that we often have people who stay for months and years, and that that's uh, in the data in our paper. You're also speaking to exactly the right distinction, which is that prisons because they know that people are coming in for years, potentially people who are coming with life sentences are going to be there until the day they die. They plan for continuity of care along the aging spectrum to some degree. Now, that doesn't mean that most prison systems have excellent geriatric and palliative care capacity within their system, but they do expect to take care of people as they age. And as an example, they have to have some system by which they are going to send people once they turn 50 for colonoscopies for cancer screening, right? Whereas that's the type of routine care that jails are not necessarily supposed to be providing because they are not supposed to be um, sites of ongoing primary care for folks. They are sort of theoretically, at least, supposed to be places that are managing um, chronic conditions for short periods of time and then are addressing urgent care needs. That means that there is a fundamental mismatch, I would say, between the way that most jail healthcare systems are designed and the needs of older um, detainees who may be coming in with severe multimorbidity, who have multiple chronic conditions, who have some degree of disability, who may have cognitive impairment, and whose healthcare burden is quite significant. So before we get into the findings in your paper about the health circumstances, I do think it's worth noting you have data from the New York City system, and there's very little data available on this topic at all. I wonder if you could say a little bit about what it is that's unique about New York system that makes these data available and why we can't find out this information in other cities or other settings. Data out of correctional facilities uh, is hard to come by, whether you're talking about jails or prisons. There is also very much a saying amongst researchers that if you've seen one correctional facility, you've seen one correctional facility. In other words, the circumstances between facilities um, are so different that you can't necessarily extrapolate what we found in New York to tell you much about what's happening in, say, Birmingham, Alabama, right? New York has a very unique situation for a couple of reasons. The first and most important one is that in New York City, we have something called an independent health authority. The entity that I worked for when I was a doctor on Rikers Island is called Correctional Health Services. Correctional Health Services is an agency under the umbrella of New York City Health and Hospitals, which is the public hospital system in New York City. Correctional Health Services is not embedded in any way with the Department of Correction. In other words, we do not have any uh, reporting structure that connects us to the security authority. This is really distinct from most correctional systems throughout the country. In most systems, including the New York State prison system, the health staff are hired under the umbrella of the Department of Corrections. And so they are reporting up in the same structure, the same hierarchy to the commissioner of prisons for this state, right? That introduces several potential dual loyalty concerns. In other words, uh, health staff who work in those systems may feel competing pressures to meet the needs or the concerns of the patient in front of them and also meet the uh, needs or priorities of the security force, right? And so often those things are coming into conflict when you're talking about jails and prisons. We in correctional health services had fewer of those dual loyalty concerns and they were minimized by the fact that we had our independent agency. Also, correctional health services has a very robust research and policy and data department. Uh, and we have an electronic medical record, which is also 
shockingly quite unique amongst correctional facilities uh, in the country. Many, many prisons and jails are still working off of paper charts. They are working, uh, you know, they're faxing pages of someone's chart between facilities. We had an electronic medical record um, and have had one for a long time. And it enabled us to both sort of, you know, pull for data, but it also enables us to do some population health management, which is really critical. Okay, we've done a lot of uh, stage setting. I know that if someone wants to get all the detail of the findings, they're going to want to read the paper, and I encourage them to do so. But uh, can you just give me a little bit of what you consider the top line findings with respect to the burn of disease for this over 55 population in the New York City jails? Sure. Should I start by just clarifying why we chose 55 as our age cutoff? That's great. Um, because I, I do think that that's an important, uh, just a, it's a last piece of stage setting that just <laughs> helps us sort of understand who exactly we're talking about. So um, I'm a geriatrician by training. When we talk about the geriatric population in the community, we generally are talking about people who are 65 years of age and older. 65 is also when you become eligible for Medicare. In uh, correctional medicine, we use a lower age cutoff to define the geriatric population. And that's because we really think that there is this, I, there's this idea of accelerated aging. Basically, we think that people who are frequently incarcerated tend to have such an excess burden of medical issues, mental health issues, functional impairment, um, that they often appear 10 to 15 years older than their chronologic age. So in other words, a 55-year-old in jail often has the same sort of uh, health burden of like a 70 year old in the community. That's important as stage setting information, because when we're talking about the older folks in jail, we are mostly talking about people in their late 50s and early 60s. The vast majority of the people I took care of were on the younger side of the elderly spectrum. I, I certainly did take care of people who were uh, in their 80s and even a few in their 90s. But the majority of folks that I took care of were in their 50s and 60s. Keeping that in mind, it's really quite striking um, how many of them, per our medical records, were diagnosed with serious chronic health conditions. The Amongst people who were 55 to 64, so again, we're talking about people who wouldn't even meet a geriatric cutoff in the community, um, 61% had one of the uh, conditions of interest in our study. And the, our conditions of interest were chronic illnesses like hypertension and diabetes, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C. Both of those are very, very common uh, relative in the incarcerated population relative to the community. 3% of our folks who were 55 to 64 re um, reported a history or a current diagnosis of cancer. And 7% of our folks 65 and older did. They also reported uh, an excess burden of disability. And we're obviously much more likely to require an assistive device like a wheelchair or a cane than people who are younger than 55. They also were more likely to be diagnosed with a serious mental illness. Serious mental illness criteria in our system um, includes people who have significant mood disorders or psychotic disorders. It's a designation that one receives that then makes them eligible for uh, you know, a special level of mental health care. And you are much more likely to be uh, diagnosed with serious mental illness if you were 55 or older. I'm really eager to get into the implications of these findings. Uh, we'll talk about some of those implications after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Rachel Bedard about older patients in New York City's jail system. Before the break, we got a high-level set of findings about the disease burden among this population and why it's important to look at people 55 and older, not just 65 and older, given the premature aging that occurs. So let's talk a little bit about that. What do we know about the conditions these folks are facing before they come in the doors of the jail? Why do they enter with a higher level of disease uh, than the population as a whole? The folks that we took care of in the jail system, as one might expect, um, are uh, incredibly marginalized in the community. Um, they have a 
disproportionate likelihood of being homeless. Our older folks in our study reported being socially isolated more often than younger folks who were coming into the jail system. Using Medicaid eligibility as a proxy for socioeconomic status, they were more likely to be Medicaid eligible. People 55 and older uh, in our study, and specifically people in the 55 to 64 year age bracket, so sort of the younger old folks in our study, reported an incredibly high use of substance use disorders. Um, And usually not only one, usually multiple concurrently, cocaine use and alcohol, cocaine and opiates, etc. And the majority of the folks in our study were not being arrested for the first time. The vast majority of the people that I took care of in jail were people who were cycling through the system with multiple incarcerations, even within a given calendar year. So uh, they are folks who were living incredibly unstable lives in the community and then were to the degree that they sort of had any continuity of care or stability or social support that was consistently getting interrupted when they would get arrested, come into the jail system, then sort of get spit back out and have to reestablish all over again. You know, it's it's quite unique for those of us who work in healthcare and health policy to speak to someone who's spent a significant amount of time delivering medical care inside uh, a jail or a prison. And so I want to take advantage of the opportunity I have speaking with you to just get a little bit more insight into how this actually works out. So you've described the characteristics of the population, but um, for those who you don't recognize from having come in a few times uh, before already that year, how do you even know what uh, health condition someone has if they've just uh, arrived at the jail? In New York City, because our agency, Correctional Health Services, was part of the New York City Health and Hospital system, we had a great, great advantage of being able to see people's medical records if they had ever been to any H&H facility, which was a great help. You know, it was incredibly useful to be able to see, oh, this person was just at a hospital for XYZ, um, even if they were new to us. Um, So sometimes we uh, had the advantage of being able to look at someone's medical chart and get a lot of information that way. The way that the system works is if a person is arrested in the community, they're arraigned in court. If the determination of, of that arraignment is that the person is going to come to jail, um, bail is set or what have you, they would be brought to an intake facility on Rikers Island. And then theoretically, there was a 24-hour clock that started. And in that 24-hour period, Department of Corrections would have to do their intake process, which was quite extensive, and the person would have to be produced to a medical clinic and have a medical intake. And that medical intake was standardized. We had a standardized interview history and physical process, and everybody went through that. And it, it was quite comprehensive, where we would try really hard to make sure that we sort of got from the person everything that we could about their medical history. If the person had significant mental health needs, they would be referred for a stat mental health referral and might get seen in that same visit by one of the mental health clinicians. If they were someone who had been on methadone or suboxone in the community and they were at risk of withdrawal, um, we would make sure that that got prescribed for them to hopefully try to prevent them from going into withdrawal. Because as you might imagine, um, not only is withdrawal incredibly uncomfortable in jail, but it sets people up for risk of Uh, overdose. So we would try to get a lot done in that initial visit. When I took care of patients, my geriatric patients who often had very complex medical histories, I also would do the same thing that I would have done when I worked in a hospital, which is I would call outside clinicians if I could get in touch with them or family members for collateral information when relevant. Again, because so many of our patients were quite socially isolated, it was very difficult to do that. And so you're right that it was quite tricky if you were taking care of someone who had significant cognitive impairment or significant mental illness, who was socially isolated, where you couldn't get collateral information, there wasn't a ton in the chart about them, and you were sort of operating blind. I'm also thinking about the prevalence of chronic conditions. And when I think about uh, what's necessary to prevent someone from deteriorating, it's a combination of continuity of usually some form of medication, but they're also often uh, non-medical components to uh, uh, sustaining your health when you have a chronic condition. I wonder if uh, you could give me a little insight into someone, again, in the population that you studied, uh, comes in and and they have uh, 
probably multiple chronic conditions. How do you approach continuity uh, as they arrive? And then at the very outset, you mentioned uh, that you worked on discharge planning. How do you think about continuity as they leave? It's such a good question, and it's just an incredibly challenging thing to do well in the jail setting. So uh, I think part of what you're getting at, right, is that our health is not only a reflection of the medical care we receive. It's it's the product of the outcome of many different inputs having to do with lifestyle, et cetera. Now, there is plenty of literature um, that demonstrates that institutionalization of any kind is bad for older folks, that when people go into the hospital for any reason, they decline, that when people are institutionalized in a nursing home or an assisted living facility, that they decline faster than folks who remain in the community. Taking that literature and sort of extrapolating it to the jail setting, right, the first thing to think about here is this was taking people out of the community and putting them in an institutional setting, and a particularly restrictive one, one where they had very little access to, you know, they have very little freedom of movement, very little access to the outdoors, no choice in what they're fed, right? So if you think about folks who come in who have dietary requirements, now there are sort of two groups of these, people who have dietary requirements because of chronic conditions like diabetes or heart failure, where they needed a diet that would be modified. The Department of Corrections was not able to sort of do that in a way that was adequately personalized, I would say, for people to make a big impact, to make a big difference. So, you know, people with diabetes would come in and their finger sticks would just go crazy because they were eating the wrong foods all the time. So that's on one side. On the other side, for older folks who would come in who would be quite scared in jail, maybe who didn't have their teeth or who had lost their hearing aids in the process of arrest, et cetera, et cetera, those folks often didn't eat. And so they would lose weight and they would become more frail over the course of their jail incarceration. So people either sort of came in and because they were very stationary and eating the wrong things gained a lot of weight, or they came in and because they were, you know, anxious and depressed and uh, not getting the food that they like, et cetera, et cetera, they lost weight. And either of those things is very bad for, uh, for older folks with chronic conditions. I also asked about uh, discharge, and that must be complex in a whole other way. Yeah, absolutely. So we, when I first started, it was the end of 2016, and I was the first jail-based geriatrician in the country. It was really inventing a role. And I spent the first year, year and a half, just seeing older people in the jail as a geriatrics consultant. And in doing so, I really came to appreciate that discontinuity was a huge crisis for them, that pulling them out of the community into jail and then sending them back out. The jail was like a black box, right? Like there was no, there was no continuity at all between what happened in the system and on the other side or very little. And so in my third year on the job, we built this service I mentioned earlier, the geriatrics and complex care service, which we tried to design in a way that was similar to the way that a geriatrics consult service would work in a hospital. Um, I had trained at Mount Sinai in New York City, which has a really robust geriatrics department. And one of its strengths is that it's very interdisciplinary. And so our team was made up of clinicians like myself, social workers, and then reentry staff and reentry staff who um, not all, but many of whom had lived experience of having been formerly incarcerated themselves and who really could help us think uh, in a very pragmatic way about what challenges people might face when they went out. And we would follow our patients from shortly after admission through until point of discharge. And then as needed, we would stay in contact with them for a month or two afterwards until we sort of thought that they were set up appropriately in the community. And we over Uh, time became, we developed great community partnerships with organizations in New York, where we would effectively hand off care for our patients, not just to healthcare providers in the community, but also to sort of patient navigators in the community who could help meet our patients, you know, once they were back in the shelter system or whatever it was, help make sure that they were getting to appointments, help make sure that they were getting a phone set up, help make sure that they were getting medications. Um, That's how it worked in the best case scenario. Jails, however, are really hard places to do discharge planning because you don't control when people leave. And so, you know, somebody would all of a sudden take a plea or their case would get resolved or bail would get paid and whoops, they'd be gone the next day and we wouldn't have had warning. And then we would sort of scramble to find them in the community, but it would be really difficult. Uh, This is such a complex system. And uh, I feel like I could 
learn from another half hour worth of talking to you. Uh, but as we come to the end of our time, I do have to note, you wrote this really powerful piece in The New Yorker about your experience at Rikers during COVID. And I realize it's not directly what your paper was about, but it seems uh, important as we finish our conversation that I give you an opportunity to give our listeners a sense of what that experience was like and what it left you with. In the New York City jail system, we were on the leading edge of the COVID epidemic for the entire country. Um, so as New York was getting hit hard in March of 2020, um, Rikers was really at the epicenter of the outbreak in the in New York City. At one point, we had uh, seven times as many cases in on the island as there were, you know, being recorded in the city. And we had seen it was like watching a tsunami approach right from the beach, you know, at sort of end of February, beginning of March, when we knew what was happening in China and we knew what was happening in Italy. We got really anxious about what would happen when the virus uh, arrived on our shores. And I, I was incredibly proud of our agency because we made decarceration, in other words, the advocacy for people to just be released from jail, if at all possible, um, a pillar of our pandemic mitigation strategy right up front. So we advocated strongly and early to say, look, we can, you know, we can quibble about where to house people or how to quarantine people or whatever it is. But the fact of the matter is that jails and prisons are setups for infectious disease outbreaks. And once the virus is in, it is going to be very difficult to control its spread. And so the best thing that we can do is decant the population and get as many people out as possible. And in between March and April of 2020, 1,500 people were released from the New York City jail system. And it was sort of the biggest exodus that the system had ever seen. And it brought the census down to a level that hadn't been seen in the city since the 1940s. And it was done quite safely. I mean, there was lots of sort of follow-up analysis to try to assess what the impact of that was on public safety. And it was quite minimal. That was a very hope. It was a very strange moment because it was incredibly terrifying, but also uh, very hopeful in this other way because there was a lot of systems transformation very quickly. The piece in the New Yorker then goes on, however, to describe what happened over the next eighteen months, which was um, much less hopeful and really discouraging. And basically, as the um, climate around criminal justice reform changed around the country, not just in New York, but also in New York. Um, appetite for decarceration and for keeping a jail population low diminished. Um, the census started to go back up. And the Department of Correction in New York, as has been sort of really well documented in the media, basically imploded in a way um, that made the jails much less safe for everyone, for staff, for officers, and certainly for detainees. And your conclusion from that experience? Uh, my conclusion, well, so I, I left that job. <laughs> I left that job in January of 2022, partly because I was quite burnt out and partly because uh, it, my work had been incredible. I, I had had this incredibly privileged position of being able to take care of patients with a lot of latitude to sort of um, take care of them the way that I wanted to, but also to advocate for decarceration. We did a lot of compassionate release work. It was really important to me. And as the system was um, increasingly dysfunctional, it became harder to do that in a way that felt satisfying. Um, and I thought that it was time to go and to maybe talk about some of these issues from the outside rather than from the inside. Dr. Bedard, I, I appreciate you sharing this story and your experience. It really is a unique opportunity for me to speak to the first geriatrician in this placement. And I do want to note as we close that for all of the limitations and challenges you mentioned, uh, New York City, as you've explained in a number of ways, has uh, more integration and more data on this than most other places. And so whatever limitations you faced are uh, amplified many times uh, where you don't have that kind of infrastructure. But it's so helpful to me to hear your experience, uh, appreciate the analysis you've done, the data you've collected, the contribution you've made. Thank you so much for being my guest on A Health Policy. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about A Health Policy. Mm -hmm.
Health Podacy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Podacy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.